We're starting now. We're starting right now. Welcome yes. to the Deb and Molly show. It's the end of the day and we're a little silly. Thanks for bearing with us. Uh, so we're going to talk about how to build a movement, an all ages movement. Um, and I have the great pleasure to be presenting with Molly, who was my one-time intern and is now like a free software superstar in her own right, recognized speaker in various countries, um, and a newly minted official employee of the Free Software Foundation. I, I feel like I can't stand, stand live up to that. Um, Deb, uh, Deb, Deb was my mentor, one of my mentors at the Free Software Foundation when I interned there. Uh, she's a rock star, both literally and figuratively. Um, and she's uh, also inspired me a lot in music, which I think is cool. Um, she's at uh, the Open Invention Network right now, doing pretty cool work and helping to fight the evil of software patents. Cool. Oh, thank you. I, yeah, this one, oh, I forgot there's a lot of business you. here on yeah. these, these earpieces, yeah. but thank you for the patch. Oh, yeah. Great, um, we have some young people and some older people. We got the whole range of Debian contributors in this room right now. Awesome. Great. So we're going to, if you want to tweet about this topic or find previous tweets, there's not like like thousands, but, um, so or if you on. have some thought about this later and you want to share it on this topic, you can. Uh, I'm Bacon and Coconut on Twitter and uh, M Millions is Molly. So, um, so we believe that in order to be successful, uh, the free software movement needs to be diverse and inclusive, uh, bringing together people from a lot of different backgrounds. We can't, uh, a monoculture is not going to get us where we want to go. So uh, we're going to cover first, just broadly so you know where we are in the program here, uh, why we care, what's going on with age in the free software movement, and some solutions that we like. So. Why do we care? Um, well, I care because I, I really like free software and I, I want to live in a world where users are empowered to use their computers for whatever they want. Uh, I care because I think user freedom is very important and that strong communities help that happen. Also, I learned that I'm old in tech at this point in my life. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a little nervous about what's going to happen next. Yeah, no, I'm actually old. Molly is only fake old. Like Molly's only like old and I'm tech old. Like cat years or something. No, I looked. I looked at. We'll get to that later. All right, we'll get to that. So, uh, so we I talked earlier this week about passing the torch, and so that's part of that. And this is going to be a more specific how tos and um, a little less on the like why you should. So. Um, this is you. Yeah. Um, let me see what the next thing. Right. Uh, we care a lot about user freedom, and we care a lot about movement building. Um, so we're going to be focusing more on free software at a higher level, as opposed to talking about specific projects and specific tools, and getting into the weeds of, of what it means to have like a free software project that's successful and broad. Um, and following up on that, we're going to be focusing more on the philosophy uh, rather than developmental models, which in this case means we're going to be talking more about what it means to, to be an all ages movement and kind of what comes out of that rather than a lot of specifics about how to make that happen. Um, though we're happy to talk about that later. That's yours. So the philosophy and the development models uh, tend to sort of feed off of each other like yeast. And uh, they happen to be both served by some of the same uh, like nice hippie stuff that we like. So for instance, like shared decision making and uh, transparency, consensus building um, are great tools and they tend to also produce uh, great results. Uh, that said, communities need to focus on the people as individuals in ways that companies might not want to or be able to. So if you, if you aren't paying people, uh, then they need to be having fun, uh, how, whatever that looks like. It might look like this. Um, because if they're not feeling valued and appreciated, then they're going to stop showing up. Cool. We're going to talk a little bit about diversity uh, and inclusivity. Um, because that's important when you're thinking about community building, but when you're actually just talking about people who have different demographics, like that's basically what you see when you get diversity. Um, uh, there was this quote that you like, that I like. One we of us liked like this. It. Yeah. Diversity jolts us into cognitive actions in ways that homogeneity simply does not. Right? 
So people actually prepare better arguments for people who aren't just like them. So if I was going to prepare an argument for Molly, like we agree on lots of things, maybe not hair color, I don't know, but, um, but on most other yeah. things we tend to agree. So I, if I was going to be like, Molly, we should do this thing, I probably wouldn't prepare the most robust argument because I wouldn't expect her to be like, I don't know, coffee sounds like a terrible idea. But if I thought she might not agree with me, I would prepare a much more robust argument. Mm -hmm. And this turns out to lead to better processes and better decision making. Uh, additionally, the kinds of ways you might talk to p different people who fit into these different demographic categories change, right? When you're trying to talk to, uh, I don't want to say your parent because lots of people's parents are like very technically skilled, um, but when you're talking to a friend of yours and when you're talking to a child, you'll be coming up with different kinds of arguments and different ways of explaining things, which is very useful when you're trying to like actually change people's minds. Do you want to hang out with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so we talked about like diversity versus inclusivity, and diversity is when you have a really nice like end of the year picture, and it looks like lots of different people showed up, which is awesome. Uh, but that's just the place where you start. Uh, a lot uh, in in like traditional nonprofit uh, fields, we look at if you have like a lot of say white people, and then the non-white people don't show up from year to year in that picture, then you've got diversity, but you haven't got inclusivity. And that means that you have to make sure they're receiving the same kind of training and professional support, and that they're being invited to the meetings where decisions are being made, and that they're being included in the processes, and they're able to envision a place for themselves within your organization from year to year. So uh, you might think about like welcoming people with open arms. Uh, not literally if they're not into hugging, you should ask first, but, um, but figuratively, right? And so, um, so the, the challenge with diversity is to make it feel like welcome is always the default as opposed to the like, um, you know, like, oh, most of our meetings are secret except for the one where we take the picture at the end of the year. And so, uh, so when you're doing that and people are coming mm -hmm. to the meetings where the actual decisions are being made, then you have a situation where you are sharing power. It might not look pretty, uh, and it might, take, it might be a little rough at first, right? But shared power is the only thing that keeps people involved in your project. If, if they suspect that they are the janitor or the like, oh, no one likes doing that pile of stuff kind of person, then they're not gonna stick around. So this is how you do movements. Cool, movements are cool. Uh, we want to do a little bit to just make people aware of minorities in tech um, and a little bit about intersectionality. Um, you know, there are a lot of different groups who are minorities in tech, um, and we're not going to talk about them all right now, but it's worth remembering that things that, like the kind of tools we have to affect change for one specific group usually also carry over to others. Uh, so who is a minority in tech? This is a good question to ask ourselves. Uh, I think Karen talked about this a little bit earlier when she was discussing outreachy. Um, I believe this was also covered in the diversity buff as well. Um, this is kind of an example of what it means to, like what a group of diverse people can look like. This particular photo is from Walk in Tech chat on Flickr, that's women of color in tech. Um, they did this photo shoot, and actually they've done several photo shoots at this point, to create stock photos of women of color. So when you need to have a cool picture of a hacker for something, you don't have to use another white dude. You can instead like find a picture of one of these awesome people looking cool. Uh, there's also cool people like this uh, as a point of diversity. You know, I, I love this photo so much. Uh, she's just like a badass hacker, totally gonna DDoS someone. She's up to no good. Um, uh, but but you know, so so another thing that like you talk about when you talk about minorities uh, is age. Um, here uh, is kind of an incomplete list we wanted to put together. This is very North American focused, as we are North Americans. Um, and we did our best to find terms that uh, seemed like they would be accurate and like they were polite. Um, but if you feel as though you fit into any of these categories and we didn't do a very good job, please talk to us about it. Um, uh, one of the, the points here that you might not have thought of before is thinking about background, right? So when we're talking, one of the things about background is not everyone 
has to be or is college educated, right? Not everybody uh, came from a middle class family. Not everybody actually has technical skills or any desire to develop technical skills. Um, also, people over the age of 35. We're going to talk about them more. Um, as for intersectionalities, intersectionality is the acknowledgement that people fit into different categories at the same time, right? So again, when we're talking about what we can do for a particular group, chances are that also works for another group. Additionally, um, somebody who's perhaps a woman in tech might also be over the age of 35 or over the age of the average Facebook employee. That's me. <laughs> Uh, so there are lots of marginalized people, and we have to kind of think about all of them, even though we're focusing on one particular group right now. This is us, oh. I think. Yeah. Uh, oppressive institutions are interconnected. Things that make women feel bad can also be the things that make women of color or people of color feel bad, can also be the things that make older people feel bad. Still, we need to talk about these things separately sometimes uh, to acknowledge that these are actual issues in and of themselves. Okay, now it's yours. <laughs> Uh, so what is going on with age? Um, there's a, I, I spent a little bit of time about two years ago looking particularly into like what was going on with representation and then how that was reflected in uh, older women's actual experiences in the technology sector. And it's uh, like if you can think of a woman over 50 that you've seen portrayed as technical on TV or in a movie that is one of the five I haven't already heard of, then let me know. There's not very many. And, and in fact, like some of them, especially in science fiction, it's because it's like a show that's gone on for like 20 years. So like Lieutenant Uhura, she didn't start out over 50, but she's there now. Um, or uh, Lieutenant Samantha Carter from Stargate, which keeps going and going and going as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I ended up talking to women and they said, you know, they got a lot of like culture fit things. They'd go and interview and people would peep out the door and be like, oh no. And, and then they would just like sit there for a little bit and eventually the receptionist would come over and be like, I'm sorry, our CTO is busy and we have to cancel your interview. And she's like, oh yeah, I, yeah, I saw him come and take a look at me and uh, noticed that I was not, you know, under 25 or something like that. So, um, so there's definitely an, an age problem. Um, I think this is you. Yeah, I like talking about how tech has an age problem. Um, uh, here's something Mark Zuckerberg said when he was a youngin. Uh, I'm not going to read this right now. I'm sorry if you're watching the video, but we'll put the slides up and those will be accessible. As in if you're watching the video, but you can't read it because it's a slide. Um, anyway, when Mark Zuckerberg was 22 or 23, he said this thing about how young people are just smarter than older people. Um, Thank you for laughing at that. I hope you guys think it's funny too. Uh, and, and he kind of like builds off of that to, to emphasize that uh, young people also have fewer responsibilities. So it's not just that you're smarter, for whatever reason you're smarter, but that you have more chance and more opportunity to do the kinds of things. Like not having a family means you can stay up all night. Um, However, young people aren't the only ones, or when Mark Zuckerberg was younger, they're not the only ones making these kinds of disparaging comments to people who are older. Um, Vinod Khosla uh, is a venture capitalist, and at 56, he said, I'm going to read this one, young people, oh, people under 35 are the people who make change happen. And older entrepreneurs fail to innovate because they are falling back on old habits. Uh, I really hope that's not the case, and I've seen some pretty cooler people doing really neat things, including some of the people in this room who I'm pretty sure are over 35. <laughs> not positive. I haven't checked your IDs. I thought um, that you had to for the key. Yeah, but I only checked Clint's. Oh, okay. And Clint's old, so that's fine. Clint's old. In case you don't know, now you know. Um, sorry. Uh, so, so there are actually a few cases in practice of this idea coming out. One particular one was in 2011. Um, Google had a settlement uh, with someone named Brian Reed. Brian Reed had been fired. He lost his job. Uh, and he believed that had been a discrimination point based on his age. People in his team had been using a lot of disparaging language referencing who he referencing like this particular identifier of him he was called obsolete sluggish and an old fuddy-duddy i didn't know people still used that um but apparently he is 
Uh, other companies, in addition to this, have gotten themselves in trouble uh, by using terms like new grads, right? This is considered a point of discrimination based on age by mm -hmm. referencing or specifying kind of the age range you would expect someone to be in based on the point of their life that they're in. Um, this is uh, in the United States, at least, age is a uh, is a age is a protected class in anti-discrimination laws and policies. Um, despite that, despite that, uh, see, I am older than now. Y'all know I'm older than 26. Uh, tech really does have an age problem. These are median employee ages from 2012. They're not the most recent. Uh, you see them varying from Facebook at 26 to at the time HP. It's a little old. Uh, not the age, the, the data. Um, that was 39, <laughs> Oracle was 38, IBM was 37, Google was 29, and Apple and NVIDIA had that at 31. Uh, there's also a correlation if you get down um, more into like the, the, uh, like the statistics reported by employees at these companies that people at HP were working fewer hours a week than people at Facebook. Um, you also see like, you know, IBM, HP, they are, they are more well-established companies that have been around for longer. Oh, this is up now. Um, we got to do this really cool thing, thanks to Zach. Um, I hope uh, many of you responded to the Debian community survey that happened uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, these are some of the results from this. We did a lot of aggregation of data. There's no access to any of the raw data uh, for most people. Um, so one of the things we found, which was very unsurprising, is that a small percentage uh, of contributors were under the age of 20. Um, we definitely have had contributors in high school uh, who have done amazing, wonderful things, um, specifically in Debian. Uh, and you see the percentage go up. You know, the median is 30 to 39. I guess that's what people are doing who no longer work at HP now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, valid percent uh, is the, okay, uh, the percent is uh, from the total number of respondents to the survey, including those who didn't respond to this question, uh, since all question, almost all of the questions were optional. Um, valid percent is among the people who actually responded, so that's uh, 820 as opposed to the 1,400, uh, almost 1,500 who responded to the survey at large. Um, so uh, this is a global survey. People responded from all over the world. Um, but you'll also know that people over 60 is 1.8% uh, of total contributors or total respondents. So that's very similar to like the high school students or the people at the beginning of college. If you're thinking about retirement as being something that happens over the age of 60 or over the age of 65, and we'll talk more about retirement later, um, that's kind of where you'll, you'll see this, this huge drop off. Uh, oh, this is me still, you still? No, no you, you like the young ones. I don't know this movie. I'm too <laughs> the young. The young ones, uh, paradoxically, is too old for Molly. <laughs> so, um, so the way we treat older and younger people in our communities is uh, often based on a lot of assumptions about what their competencies are, what their technical level is. And um, of course, those assumptions are pretty different. And we're going to take a look at the young people first. Um, so young people, we're talking kind of not in that sweet spot of just having graduated uh, college with a CS degree and uh, getting a job at Facebook, uh, but before that, uh, you know, like in high school, the place where we saw 1.7% uh, of Debian contributors. And this is, um, I think these are people that we want to bring into our communities to drink the proverbial Kool-Aid before they, you know, um, get tainted or wherever. And, um, so, th so I, I, we have a lot of opportunity here. Not in the, the Kool-Aid is, is good. Oh uh, yeah, I'm just thinking of lots of jokes about Kool-Aid in my head. <laughs> um, I think there's less serious. Uh, what do we say about cats? There's something about cats. Oh, uh, that's still there you. There has but, to be a cat slide. There always but has to there's be a cat has to, This is, we both have cats. This is not either of our cats. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but, um, 
Uh, what was I saying here? I'm so sorry, guys. Thank you for your appreciation. Right. Um, one of the reasons why uh, companies prefer younger, like recent grads and younger employees, ties back to what Mark Zuckerberg said when he referred to older people uh, as have as you know having families. When he's like, younger people don't have the same kinds of responsibilities that keep other people from be that keep older people from being good tech employees. And coincidentally, they don't have as much experience negotiating salary. So it's a it's a win win if you want someone to do an eighty hour work week mm -hmm. at uh, kind of chump money for tech. Yeah, uh, this was an advertisement uh, that was in the New York subway. Um, it, Fiverr is a uh, is a platform that allows people to perform small tasks. I think it, they're all five dollars each. Uh, and this this slide is a picture of a woman who looks like. Well, her makeup's good, but she looks particularly tired in theory, uh, and it emphasizes this idea of the things that you do instead of taking care of yourself, and how this is a desirable trait uh, that you'll see in people. Let me make sure. Okay, great. Um, and you know, following from that to the the next point, um, which is actually younger people don't take time off of work. I don't know how many of you felt uninclined to do so. I know I did, especially during my first few jobs. I didn't feel as though that was an acceptable thing to do. It turns out a lot of other people who are millennials uh, or self-identify in that age group or are put in that age group uh, have the, the, same, the same thing. You know, they, they are worried that they'll be fired. They'll be worried that people think that they don't have a commitment to their job. They're worried that uh, like they'll lose their positions at work or not have means of advancement uh, in those cases. Do you want me to talk about Wesley? The whiz Oh, kid? I talk oh, about Wesley Crusher. The, yeah. I talk about Wesley Crusher. Uh, <laughs> Spoiler alert, he's on the next slide. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he's on the next slide. Um, so our question is, you know, are, are younger people actually contributing to free software? Um, and as we saw, we have some concrete numbers of that. And the answer is kind of yes, but not really all that many. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually curious uh, how many of you, uh, like since most of you at this are probably contributors in some way, whether that is by using software, or by talking to people about software, or like you know having a leadership position within a technical community. Um, so uh, I, I'm curious who here became involved when they were like in college. You can like raise your hands. Oh, good point. Probably um, uh, age 17 to 21. Okay. Yeah. How many of you, when you were in high school? A few of them. Oh, right. Uh, Sorry. Uh, 14 uh, to 17. 17. Age 14 to 17. Okay. You got a few of them. Uh, and, and even younger than that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go you. <laughs> uh, You're forgiven. <laughs> you know, my, my follow-up question to that is, is how many of you are Wesley Crusher, right? Because Wesley Crusher was this magical kid who knew everything. He was the most brilliant person on the ship. He could fly it. He could fix things. He, you know, he was, he, he was this person that we have as this ideal of the young contributor or the young person involved. Um, but, you know, we're actually not like that. Most Mostly. of us are like the rest of the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Uh, we're going to ignore Harry from this photo because he also, much like Wesley Crusher, shows up with this wonderful magical skill set that makes no sense based on his background. Um, it's a magical staircase yeah, yeah, yeah. that he lived under. Yeah. yeah. Uh, meanwhile, you have the rest of the group, the rest of the team, the rest of these young people who are you know, they need to practice, they need to try hard, they need to have mentorship, they need to have other people and older people and more experienced people, as well as their peers who know more than them, help them along to become good contributors, right? Uh, having mentors is great. Your mentor can be slightly older than you. Your mentor could be your age. Your mentor could be a lot older than you. Uh, and mentors actually might not mean what you think they mean. It isn't necessarily somebody who helps you with your project, who sets aside time each week to talk with you. It could be a friend who can help you do things like not be universally stupid, who can help you, you know, dress better so you don't look like your mother dressed you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also, when we're thinking about younger people getting involved with free software, it's kind of important to think about the tools we use to make free software work. Um, 
There, you know, we, a lot of us, we use wikis, you know, we use, uh, like what's up there, we'll use Git, or in some cases even Subversion still. Um, and then we use IRC. Uh, and these, these are all tools that I love to use, and I assume you like them as well. She's on yeah. IRC sometimes. Yeah. Um, but they're hard to use. They're crunchy, uh, it's easy, it, it's, many people interact with them with these old clunky systems directly through their terminal. Uh, and that can be like a hard starting point for someone, especially someone who's young, whose early interactions, majority of interactions with technology are these very smooth processes where they can't even take apart their tablet to see what's inside of it. So now Deb talks about old So people. now we've talked about young folks, we're going to talk about the olds. Um, so you mentioned that uh, representation really matters, but um, we also have this situation where, uh, you know, people are going out to try and get jobs and, um, and the, the way that they're perceived is that they won't know what they're doing or they won't be able to, you know, to do this thing. Um, a lot of the women that I talked to about their experience as an older woman in tech said that they were uh, somewhat or very afraid of trying to find their next job, that they were, they were worried that they weren't going to find another place and that each one would be the last one that they would be able to find in tech. Um, and uh, in fact, this, uh, I have one quote from this woman who said, uh, discriminating against older workers, men and women, is, uh, seems socially acceptable. Uh, you have to work hard not to hire over anyone over 30, but just about every startup in Silicon Valley manages to do this, which is like at a time when companies are poaching each other's employees, um, at a time when everyone is loudly complaining about this shortage of technical people. Um, and, uh, you know, they're working hard to make their company seem the funnest, like we have the ping pong and the, the candy and the, you know, like whiskey Wednesdays and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and a lot of times companies are courting each other's employees and trying to, you know, pull them away with uh, ever increasing benefits and, and funness at work. Um, meanwhile, there, there's a whole category of other folks that are like, I'm actually smarter than those three people you just hired put together, um, but I don't care about ping pong, actually. Um, so I like ping pong okay, but I can do it at, on my own time. So, uh, so discriminating against older workers is, is pretty rampant. Um, and some of the older women that I spoke to were basically just kind of like, yeah, I'm too old for this shit. Um, they just, they've moved out of tech. I've met so many women who, um, I don't know if you know this, in the US public libraries now have a lot of computers, uh, but they don't exactly hire sysadmins. So like some technical women have sort of drifted over to be like an unacknowledged sysadmin at a library or something like that. And, and there's other places like, or they've found like some other corner that's like a little bit technical, but not, not like playing the Silicon Valley game. Um, Another thing that uh, older women uh, said to me that happened to them is uh, it, it felt like they were put, being pushed into this sort of den mother role where it was like, oh yeah, you don't need to code anymore. You can maybe help these folks uh, work on their projects. Um, and this thing where women get pushed into management and like a mentoring role and not doing their own technical work is is, is pretty common. And so some women do want to move into a, a management role, but not all, and it's a lot of the ones who don't want to move there feel a little bit pushed. So this is you. Cool. I'm gonna talk about volunteering. I think volunteering is great, and that's what free software is powered by, volunteers. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you in this room aren't, get pay, aren't getting paid uh, directly for your free software contributions. I know some people at the conference in general are, and that's really cool. Uh, most of us are volunteering our time because we care about it. Uh, volunteering is great and it's a highly intergenerational activity. Um, it's one of the, the places where you'll go and you'll be able to work and learn from people who are both younger and older than you at the same time. One of my like, little anecdotes about this is I volunteer at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston and I'm the youngest volunteer by like 20 years. <laughs> it's great. I love it. I love hanging out with those people. Um, here are some numbers on, on how volunteering looks like when you're young. Um, between 12 and 18, actually about like a little over half of younger people uh, 
younger people being between the ages of 12 and 18 uh, are volunteering and maintaining volunteer roles. 29 hours per year is the median number uh, that they're putting in. That's not a lot that, you know, comes out to, yeah, one every two weeks or something like that, <laughs> uh, approximately. Um, and a lot of those are in youth or religious organizations, things that are focused on getting young people involved in things. Uh, so, so this is kind of useful for us to think about when we're thinking about how to bring younger people uh, into free software, how to take advantage of this group who are participating uh, for the sake of participating and helping. Um, also, uh, you know, it actually turns out that in the United States for high school, uh, schooling between the ages of you know, 14 and 17 or 18, you're required to volunteer at a number of schools. It's, uh, it's something that will help you get into college and university uh, and your post-secondary education. Uh, and, and actually, it's like a super competitive thing now. So it turns out that over, this was from, uh, I believe, a Harvard admissions counselor who'd said they, they'd seen an application from someone who had 250 volunteer hours over four years of their education, and they weren't impressed by it. They are like, yeah, this is great, but 250 hours, we've seen more. That's kind of depressing, because <laughs> that's a lot of time. Uh, on, the other, you know, on the other side of it, when you're looking at retirees, you, that's where you're also getting a large number of people who are volunteering. It's 42% of people age 65 plus, as opposed to 55, percent from the younger group. However, uh, generally retirees aren't required in some way to volunteer, but you will see younger people fulfilling those requirements. Uh, they are hitting more hours at 96. Uh, again, many of them are in religious organizations. One of the metrics when we talk about volunteering and when we're judging the success uh, and, and involvement of volunteers is looking at groups contributing more than 500 hours a year. Uh, in this one particular demographic, elderly meaning over 65, 10% uh, of those uh, volunteers accrue more than 500 hours per year. That's a really impressive number. So since many of these people are also participating, maybe we should think about what they can do with us. It's, it's like the general uh, trend for volunteering outside of free software is a huge number of young people, almost nobody in their 30s and mm -hmm. 40s and 50s, and then a whole ton mm -hmm. of people in their 60s and 70s and 80s. And free software is the inverse of that. Yeah. Uh, this, these are kind of some examples of organizations that we think do a good job at creating intergenerational volunteering and intergenerational communities. Uh, we'll save some time by maybe not going through all of them, but I would like Deb to mention political work. Yeah, political work is something that um, commonly, like they'll find something for, if you show up with your seven-year-old, they will stuff envelopes. Um, if also you, at the FSF, you can show up and stuff envelopes. You can show up and stuff envelopes at the FSF too. Um, but political campaigns will find something for you to do at any age. Uh, and it's the same with many of these other organizations. Girls Rock Camp is a feminist organization that, uh, you know, all women's space. And, and it's the population they serve is girls from 7 to 17. But the volunteers, like, go from 18 all the way up to uh, 60s and retired. So it's a lot of organizations do a great job of bringing together an intergenerational uh, group of volunteers. Um, so, uh, so younger people and older people like to use their time to do good, um, except in free software, apparently. <laughs> so, think so, about that. So, we, what we're saying is, um, this is not a. It's more of a like, wow, look at all this opportunity. So, um, we're going to talk about some uh, organizations and solutions that we like that are starting to um, do some of this work in the free software space. So, um, so we would really like to see uh, a movement built where, uh, you know, young people, old people, in the middle people all show up and find something to do and, uh, and they don't feel unwelcome. There's not a lot of like, oh yeah, go ahead and sit over there, old lady or whatever, you know. Like it's got to be, uh, like we said, inclusive and, uh, and truly uh, part of the, of the movement. So, 
Uh, I say we have about 10 minutes left, so rather than going through these exhaustively, uh, I'll instead point out that, so these are some organizations and projects and things happening uh, to get younger people involved. A lot of them are education-based, uh, a lot of them are community-based, and a lot of them are active participation-based, where you're getting people getting their hands dirty, either in terms of like really learning this non-physical thing or working with a physical thing. Uh, Kids days at free software conferences especially are really cool. Uh, and then there are some great things happening to get older people involved who are either technical or non-technical. Uh, one I work on is opensource.com that has a lot of older people who are interested in tech but that wasn't their career and so they're excited to write about it. Um, but there are some, uh, some other great places for um, older volunteers to plug in either technical or non-technical. Mm -hmm. Uh, and learning those skills as well, which you'll see in both groups. Uh, there, there are lists of uh, educational resources that are geared towards different age categories. And so, uh, and some of these things, uh, some of them do a good job in places of being non-age specific, others not as much. Obviously, like many of them could uh, improve, as, especially I know like um, some of the FOSS conferences that I've gone to, it's like, cool, now we're gonna like cram into a bar up a little rickety pile of stairs and listen to techno music uh, speakers that are placed all over the wall. And I like, you know, I know I said I'm old, but I'm not that old, but even I'm not like, yeah, that sounds like a fun time where we shout at each other kind of thing. Um, so some of the stuff that we'd like to see happening. Right. Um, We'd like to see more non-coding options for kids. Coding, uh, learning to code and learning technical skills is an advanced uh, thing that takes a lot of time. It's pretty easy to get anyone to stuff envelopes. But there are other things people can do as well. Projects, big projects, successful projects, have people who are doing work across a wide range of different things. Whether that stuff is coming up and speaking, uh, and I've seen, I've seen youths, like I've, I, uh, is that, um, mm -hmm. I was at one conference when I saw a 13-year-old uh, presenting about things that she was doing um, with uh, free software technology. So she's technical skills, but there were projects she worked on on her own, and she talked about her experience in contributing. Right? You can have people do all sorts of other things that we won't talk about now, but if you look at awesome lists of stuff people are doing, they're all over. Deb is a great example of someone who does a lot of non-technical stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, and I was going to say that yeah. some of the other things we'd like to see happening is more support for moms returning to the workforce that want to do technical work. Um, we have a lot of affinity groups within some of our, um, uh, some of our technical uh, communities, but, you know, maybe we could have, this is something that churches and other organizations do a lot of. They have like a junior or a youth affiliate group. And then um, the Southern California Linux Expo does a great job of having an all ages social event where like the first two hours there's not loud music and there's like games all over and then kind of as kids go to bed like people show up and it gets a little darker. Uh, oh, affinity group means like, uh, like a group, uh, he, the question was what's an affinity group and an affinity group is like a group within like so a group within a larger group. So it might be like the women's auxiliary or something, or um, a lot of colleges have uh, like an Asian American club or something like that. So to like within a larger group to be like, hey, we have something else in common additional to the larger group that we would like to hang out and talk about or do activities that are particularly mm -hmm. interesting to us. Yeah. Uh, as a tech specific or Debian specific example, somebody, uh, there might be a group of journalists who are interested in technology and how they can incorporate tools like Debian uh, and some of the wonderful things like GPG into their work. So those are groups with similar goals trying to work together. So we're at the important part Call to action. Call to action. Okay. That's where we ask you to do stuff. Yes. And, and then after that, we'll take questions. Um, the only actual questions, though, I don't want any statement and answer. I'm just telling you now. So, uh, so our call to action is to find ways to bring people in and make them feel comfortable and really, truly part of your team. Um, and to empower these people to become real members of your community where, you know, they get to vote and they get to come to the secret cabal meetings that aren't secret anymore. <laughs> um, I know they're not secret if they're that. And, and then, uh, you know, there might be something that you're doing that like you could pass on to someone and 
I would say look for ways to like kind of get out of the way a little bit and pass on some of those things. Like you don't need to be completely indispensable. I feel like it would be much more exciting to be like, look, I made 20 new people that want to like contribute to Debian instead of I do 20 things that no one else knows how to do. So we'd like to hear from you. Um, you can still you can still get us on Twitter mm -hmm. or IRC, you know. Um, and um, did, did I forget anything before we go no. to questions? No. Okay. Deb's on Mastodon. I am on, on yeah. I think I have a GNU social account. If you're not into Twitter. If you're not into Twitter, it's true. We have a or IRC. I'm free Deb there. So. I'm not. No, I am on IRC. Yeah. For some reason, I, I thought you said ICQ. <laughs> I was really confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, cool. So uh, I hope you're excited to help us build an all ages free software movement. So thanks. And we'll take your questions. Uh, it seems there is a microphone if, uh, yeah. Who has questions? or comments. Uh, one way in the back. Could someone run the mic, please? Great, young people stepping up to volunteer. I love it. Look, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I came in late, so maybe you've already answered this. Okay. Um, but I'd just like to ask, how, how do you define a volunteer. I mean, one uh, thing you mentioned is that yeah. um, that people are requ required to do volunteering, and mm -hmm. for me, that's not a volunteer. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not required. It's I think you mean not legally required. It's just that uh, high school students in the U.S. they know if they want to go to prestigious no. schools that they oh are they at some of yeah, them? Yeah. So oh, okay. um, uh, I don't know. I grew up in Philadelphia, and in Philadelphia, uh, when you're doing your high school education, you're actually required to have a certain number of volunteer hours in order to graduate. Uh, and then I guess you move get to pick it. what organization. Yeah, you do get so. to pick what organizations you, you do that. Um, All right, I think we're getting off yeah. topic. Uh, volunteer work is most easily defined as things you are do you are choosing to do uh, to ideally help some good. Uh, or produce some good that you're not getting paid for. You might get other wonderful perks like uh, coffee, like coffee um, mm -hmm. and snacks, pride. Um, okay, yeah. uh, we'll take one here and then. Uh, if there is someone who's not a man that would like to ask a question, uh, I, not after you, that, but um, I just want to throw that out there because I know, like myself, it sometimes takes me an extra minute to think of my questions. So this is your minute, ladies. Or, or if you're and, and, under 25 or over yeah. 65. Okay, uh, so I'm from Europe, so and I'm I was listening to your presentation, but it was like from other world or something like this. So mm -hmm. it seems how much uh, U.S. specific is this? Because I'm I was working in Poland. Now I work in Germany. In mm -hmm. my Polish company, we used to have two groups of people: middle age or something, and your younger just students and Students were jumping through jobs, and middle ages people tend to stay longer. The same I can observe in Germany. In my team, we are dealing mostly with uh, with administration, and we don't have anybody below 30. So it's not ju ju just that we are discriminating. Basically, people tend younger people tend to jump through jobs, and we need mm. more stability in jobs. So right. how much specific it, it is to U.S. and to Sikh culture called uh, Silicon Valley? So uh, our numbers, our specific numbers, are from U.S. companies and U.S. numbers about volunteering. Anecdotally, I have been told that some of these ideas about hiring only people under 26 have been uh, sort of becoming contagious. In, mm -hmm. Not necessarily, I don't know specifically about Poland or Germany, but in some of the other countries that I've been to where there's a lot of software being developed. Uh, another note is, US, on a US specific note here, uh, it, is, it is becoming more common for people uh, all across the, the age range to be in jobs for shorter periods of time, especially in tech. Do we, real quick, do we have any like women who are interested in asking questions or? 
younger people. Now we're putting but... everyone on the spot. That's oh, sorry, okay. guys. Okay, all right, you can you got another chance in a minute. All right, go ahead. Um, it might be a political statement, but um, one thing that I have experienced is helping a lot in this area is that having young people actually act as old people. AKA having a job where they say, oh, you know what, I'm not going to work more th than 30 hours and the ping pong is fine, but I'm going home at five and that's, that's it. And that, that leads in the direction of saying, it has to be a cultural change also in the wider just job market as mm -hmm. well as in the tech job market. Saying, and, and we as young people, or maybe I should not say we now, Probably. <laughs> but Once you're older, that's over, a moving target. Once you're over 26, we you're should, just we old. Should, we should all be also requiring correct job uh, conditions, and that's I mean part time, and all all these um, uh -huh. uh, conditions that are better also just make it easier for women to, who also want to work part time or, or or older people that, who want to work part time. If it's a default, also for young people that we hire, it's just easier to not be the special snowflake. So yeah, that's a no, cultural and political change that needs to happen as well. Yeah, if you're asking if I'm pro-unionizing tech work, the answer is yes. So. Uh, since, I'm, since I'm over 65, I, I guess I'm one of the marginalized groups. Um, in the first part of your presentation, you raised some very interesting uh, I, uh, things about issues about paid work, not just volunteer work, that I think link to what you're saying about volunteer work. And part, one way of looking at the link is the degree to which people cooperate with each other in mm -hmm. wherever it is they're working or volunteering. The, there was a list of points that you had about why young people work too long. It was things like afraid not to get uh, uh, promoted or seen not pulling away and all that kind of stuff. This may be un this may not be something you're familiar with in the U.S., but in Canada, a lot of IT people are unionized. Uh, mm. If they work for the government, if they work for universities, uh, health institutions, and so on, it's very frequent. That not always, but it's very, there's a lot of IT people who are unionized. I was I worked at a university as staff, and I uh, within the union I was very active in the union for about 20 years, mm -hmm. and those points that you listed are exactly the things that we tried to build in to our contracts, mm -hmm. so that people weren't wouldn't be worried about uh, working at a healthy pace yeah. and working. Uh, to meet their own needs and so on. Right. But we could only gain those sorts of things through cooperation. Right. And that's why there's been more talk, uh, at least again in the US, sorry guys. Um, I live in the US, I hear a lot about that. Uh, that's where there's been more talk around things like unionizing technical workers and people who don't just work at universities or small nonprofits. Yeah, Molly and I have both been uh, workers at uh, yeah. Both union workers and in a technical yeah. capacity. I like to think that gives me mad leftist cred. <laughs> yeah. Agrees. So, uh, do you have any theories as to why um, why we are not attracting all these volunteer demographic? Like, why are we attracting work mostly from the people that are already too busy doing work? Oh. Yeah, so uh, I think we didn't make this point today, but the those folks who are getting hired between 21 and 27 literally don't have any extra time. Um, and so that's, uh, I think, why we're not getting a lot of volunteer work there. No, no, there. I, I mean the young people. Like all you the and old younger people. high school. Like young, young. Um, there yeah, are, go ahead. Yeah. There isn't a lot of obvious spaces for people to participate unless they already have intense technical skills. Uh, all of the high schoolers I have met in the Debian project are amazing, but they're also all coders. You know, when I first started, when I got first started getting involved in free software, mostly what I did was stack chairs at events um, <laughs> because that was the skill set I had. But it was a very unique thing. I was definitely the youngest person there, 
Uh, and it's like, it can actually feel a little degrading even to be the person stacking chairs when you're like, oh, there's Deb Nicholson and she's like doing all this cool stuff and going around and like fighting patents and, and I'm gonna stand here and stack some chairs. You should ask me to help you with the chairs. Well, everyone should volunteer to help with the chairs. Um, but, Everyone should help with the chair. But it's also, it's, it right. also is things like, oh, we're having our meetup and you can come to our meetup, but it's going to be at a bar, it's going to start yeah. at 9 p.m. and it's going to go till midnight. Um, so I, I just think that uh, tech um, and free software doesn't do a good job reaching out to, to younger people. Um, doesn't do a good job at creating specific opportunities for them and doesn't do a good job making it clear all the different kinds of things they can do that are valuable contributions. Right. All right, I think we have just one more and then it's on to like the party part. All right. It's dinner then party. Dinner then party. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Yeah, should we take that one or no? <laughs> I'm sorry, we didn't see any of the signs. Make it quick. Uh, what about uh, working with uh, high schools and, and, <laughs> and you have examples of, of things that have worked working with high schools and colleges yeah. where people have uh, tasks assigned to them and, uh, and working with teachers to assign tasks related to free software projects. Is that how, is that, I, we all, I think we yeah. all know that exists, but statistically, how does that? There is a really great example, and we kind of blew past it on here, it's the Penn Manor program. Uh, Red Hat's been really involved with them, and what they've done is, you know, they get some older computers, and they have like a hodgepodge of different stuff donated by parents or whatever, and the kids are the sysadmins for the school computer systems. So that's something that we could replicate at other schools. Uh, I'm not going to go any deeper because we completely ran out of time. But uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Thanks Molly, for, for sticking around. Oh, yeah. nice, Deb. Yeah. Oh, sorry, All right. Thank you. I, I also just kind of want to add after the fact, I really appreciate TZ's enthusiasm at getting involved with free software. Look at him trying to come up on the stage. It's great. <laughs>